Welcome to the Warley Motoroi Club virtual event featuring club life, the exhibition and the exhibitors. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Hello, my name is Ian Carter and welcome to the Warley Motoroi Railway Club. I'd like to talk to you about a recent project done regarding the history of the steam locomotive. It's actually called the Great British Steam Locomotive from Cradle to the Grave. And it means exactly that, it's the whole history. Um, obviously we're looking now at where the history started, so I'd like to go through now exactly how we actually carried out each project. Welcome to the Warley Motor Railway Club virtual event, featuring club life, the exhibition and the exhibitors. We hope you enjoy this presentation. This project came about when I had a modelling ambition to a model of the Raynell trials. So I started doing the research in order to do a fairly accurate model. After getting totally engrossed in this history, I decided why not model the whole history. About the same time, at the Warley 2018 exhibition at the NEC, I spoke to Cliff Parsons of Gresley Beat fame and coordinator of AMREC, which is the Ashford International Model Railway Education Centre, a new venture in the form of a permanent exhibition for many quality model railways supported by some high profile and famous modellers. This venture came about when two young lads asked when looking at a layout, what's that black stuff? Obviously referring to coal, these guys and these lads had never seen coal before. With the ethos of AMREC is could we educate through model railways? Initially I wanted to portray the technical development of, it, of the steam locomotive but this would be very difficult to do with, with most developments hidden under the bonnet so to speak. So with the ethos of AMREC I decided to model the general influential developments and relevant engineers and who influenced who, including world events affecting the railways as well. Most of the research came from my own collection of books and models from the club library. The only trouble is that with the very early stuff, one book would contradict another. And the very early images were really only artist sketches or occasional um, portrait. Okay, so here we have the first section that's based around the 1600s. Obviously everything the history evolves around mines, mine workings and a lot of the mines had problems with water ingressing to the mines so they needed somebody to pump the water out. So there we have a pumping engine. Later on when the steam engine, stacky steam engine developed they also had winding engines and then engines for inclined planes. At the same time they use wagons and horses, single wagons and horses, to convey the coal and minerals down to the nearest port or river because the roads were so bad at the time. We also have a pack horse bridge here just to show what things were like in those days. The progression from them was to use multiple wagons with multiple horses. And then along came a man called Richard Trevorthick who invented the very first steam engine. And then we have it there with the cauldron wagons behind. I'd like to show you just briefly how I actually did these wagons. First of all, I used wool, wool, Will's 2mm planking with mico strip added, painted an oak collar, and then weathered to varying degrees to create variation. This was put on a square timber section subframe which also created the dumb buffers. That was glued to that. In turn, Langley wheels were put together with axles. So the two were married together like that. And that's how the wagons were produced. The scenery themselves, that was used uh, modern insulation material covered with ordinary plaster to create the rock effect. The track bed itself is um, foam board with a track direct light straight onto it. That's actually angled plate weight track. 
The buildings again use foam board base with plastic card added and then weathered to get a realistic effect. The timber on the winding engine that was just probably old rocket sticks uh, and any timber that was come to hand. The shoes were used using coffee stirrers with little strips of wood added onto that to make the shoots as well and then a bit of engage track for the trap there. The same with the bridge at the back that's based on the Causey arch that was foam board covered in plastic card and then weathered. The rear itself that was sealed uh, and then little stones added before we poured the varnish to give the rear effect and if you can see there you can see it's rather black coming away from the mine from where we got the water coming out the pump. Okay this is section number two. This is basically round about the start of the 1800s so we're 100 years late from the, the very start. This cameo really is showing what life was really like uh, before the railways with these badly rutted roads and the other thing was they didn't like using roads because of the toll charges. Here we have a model of a toll house actually that's a Wills model uh, and it shows a junction of roads, one going up in the hills, one carrying on under the tunnel. Um, the tunnel itself is based on the images of when locomotion ran up the first time in the S and D, the, the Stockton and Darlington Railway. That's a uh, basic Amard.com model with the wagons at the back and the bridge itself is the same again, it's foam board covered in plastic card. As you see on the track, the track in them days was on stone blocks so again I've emulated the stone blocks with foam, little pieces of foam board with fine scale track on top of those. There's a little cameo there of what life was like with, as far as transport with horses uh, the model, I saw that base down at the Great Doors of Steam Fair, how they actually did that, so I modelled that as well. Okay, so this is Cameo 3, based on the Rainhill Trials. This date would be around about 1829. It's actually opened in 1830. So this is based on the Rainhill Trials. We're, everybody knows Rocket. Uh, not many people know the other locos that took part. There was actually ten, but there was only five that was really in the contention. It was, that one was Perseverance. Novelty was the crowd's favourite. Sans Peral was uh, another favourite. And then we have Cyclops, which is a bit tongue-in-cheek, tongue but it was basically driven by a horse. And then at the very back, we have Northumbrian. These all these kits were from the Dapol range. Northumbrian was kit bashed from a Dapol kit. The rest, because there's nothing else, anything like it, all had to be scratch built. Basically, all bits from a, a bits box, and then basically plastic card framework and plastic card frames on the for tanks and things like that whatever bits came available for the right part. This was basically uh, strip plastic card and then the track itself or the whole trap bed is, is on foam board again with the track direct glued straight onto the track. The structures at the back for the retaining walls, steps and everything was built by another club member by named Jim Smith. Again the same principle, foam board shell with plastic card facing. This time we used actually paving slabs that we normally use on, pa on uh, platforms because this was the nearest thing to cut stone. The other problem was people, very hard to get people to that era so there was quite a few wedding 
scenarios used. The brides were painted a different colour rather than white. And it's very difficult to people with top hats of that era. So there was a lot of work involved in doing all the figures for these. There are a couple of Hampson cabs on top. A bit of modeler's license there. It was about five years too early for Hampson cabs, but I thought they looked the part. Okay, so we were on scenario four with the diorama of the navvies. Without the navvies, the railways wouldn't have happened. Right at the back, I've modelled the tunnel being constructed. Again, this is strip wood, foam board for the walls, and plastic card for the. I think I actually used a soil pipe cut in half to form the tunnel and plastic guard added both inside and on the outer edge to emulate the ring arches being made. This diorama is actually based on the tring cutting and this is just a few hundred yards or a hundred yards of miles and miles of track and all this track was cut out by hand using just picks and shovels and wheelbarrows. The wheelbarrows inclines themselves, I didn't realise to study the photo, but found out later that they actually built up the banks on the inclines to reduce the rake of the barrow walks. The barrow walks again were made out of coffee stirrers, strip wood added for the supports, and then Langley wheels for the pulleys. The interesting thing about this is I always thought the horses pulled the wagons directly away but they pulled the barrows with a rope up to a top pulley down to a bottom pulley and pulled it along the bank so they could observe the barrow coming up the incline again a lot of the figures took a lot of painting when I'm painting figures I always start with the flesh first then the white shirts and then whatever they're wearing on top and then finish off with trousers and boots. We've also modelled the bricks in there and on one of the, the research photos there was even foreman standing on rocks observing what's going on below. Okay, so now we're on diorama five. This is based between the 1840s and 1890s. Still very much a rural scene, but the main era of this was they were big wheelers. They were all big wheelers. We have the Great Western's first ever loco ever built, North Star. We have a Caledonian Railway, big wheeler at the top there. A Great Northern Railway, big wheeler of this side, and I had to include this loco because this was George Stevenson's long boiled loco, which was way ahead of its time, I think. When you look at it, it was an 060 in 1842, and really 060s didn't come around till the turn of the next century. Okay, so this is based on a basic model. Obviously everything was weathered, to look more realistic, with real coal added. The two locos at the back are based on aimer.com static locos, again altered. This one very much altered with the cab cut down, other bits added to make it more realistic, and the front buffer beam which is generic to that particular loco. The other thing uh, with this era is a lot of the ballast was probably ash rather than the ballast we know today because there was loads of ash from all these mine workings from the mine engines so that's what they used in the, that particular period and this really just creates the type of scene that was at that particular period okay so here we have diorama six this is based really from 1890s to the turn of the century um, and where the locos here were predominantly 440s. 
four for O's being two sets of drive wheels coupled together to give more power. Again, a lot of the locos here are aimer.com, static locos, again weathered with real coal added. There is one Great Western loco there was a kit model, and again real coal added to the back of that. The both engine sets are propriety engine sheds, again as you can see, well weathered to look more realistic. The other thing to note here is the ballast has now changed to more darker ballast more akin to what we're familiar with today. And again, the whole track bed is on a foam board with the track directly glued to that. And the scenery the same as we've said before. Okay, so now we're on diorama seven. This is the period just after grouping where all the companies were grouped into four major groups being the Great Western, the Southern, the LMS and the LNER. This period was probably the period of speed more than anything so that's why I've included all the four streamliners of each company. The models themselves again aimer.com with that was the hardest model to do with all the, the basic model we added the streamlining both on the buffer beam the front end and the sides obviously this was a an era of speed we have the coronation there which had the world record in 37 of 114 miles an hour and of course mallard the world record beta 126 which still holds today for any steam locomotive. On the back we have several other locos of the depot just to emulate what things were like at that period. And again the ballast, ballast has changed to a more recognizable ballast that we know today of the grey ballast. And the other thing I've modeled here is the cesses, not many people model cesses but obviously all railways needed drainage to get rid of the water. If they didn't have drainage, the banks would collapse. Okay, okay so here we have a post-war era of nationalisation when British railways took over the railways themselves after the war. We have a typical BR depot with standard locos being serviced, which were running at the time together with other locos of the past but are ready for scrappage. BI actually inherited 20,000 locos to be scrapped in favour of the BR standards. One or two locos were kept back for preservation as we can see one loco there that's ready for preservation there. There's also if you can see right down the front there's one guy recording the proceedings before everything is lost. If we look over to the other side, we can actually see the scrap pile, which probably brings a tear to many eyes. There's also a, a scrap loco being cut up. Uh, I've used modelled brass tube with a bespoke tube, tube plate made out of plastic card, with holes drilled in it. The tube's pushed in place to show what it's like inside. Also, when they took these copper tubes off, that was obviously worth a lot of money, so they kept them to one side as a tube rack there. All the bits on the back are obviously bits of locos cut up. Um, to form the pile, I actually stuck them all to a foam board base. So we can see lots of anatomy of locos there. This was all based on a scrapyard in South Wales and this is the picture I used for that cameo. As you can see, there are information boards on the front attached to each cameo explaining that particular period. Everything is in date order, uh, what happened when, who influenced who, and some of you may have already seen the whole exhibit at the 2019 Wally show. 
Uh, it was programmed to be in the 2020 show, but unfortunately, for obvious reasons, that's gonna, not going to happen. It is programmed to be in the Walling Model Railway show on the 27th and 28th of November in 2021. And it's also programmed to be a permanent exhibition at AMREC in Ashford when that opens in the future. Maybe one day we will continue the story with modern traction with diesel and electric up to the present day. Thank you for watching this Wally virtual event presentation. Please remember to like, comment and subscribe. We hope to see you when we are back at the NEC on the 27th and 28th of November 2021. Welcome to the Worley Motor Railway Club virtual event featuring Club Life, the exhibition and the exhibitors. We hope you enjoy this presentation. Hi, I'm Andy. I'm Roger. So we've got this Dapple wagon, we've come from Dapple, it's a brand new wagon that they're releasing uh, towards the end of this year. What are we going to do with it? We're going to make it look more realistic and put a bit of dirt on it. Using airbrush powders, paints, uh, pigments, mixing them together to achieve the end result and the looking as realistic as possible. That's great. And thanks for sharing your skills, Roger. That's a pleasure. Okay, so let's have a quick chat about what you're using to, uh, to spray the, uh, the wagon for the weathering. Mainly acrylics, um, all Tamiya based acrylics. Uh, using their acrylic thinners as well. If I'm doing a show, we always use acrylics because it's a lot safer than using enamels, and I can produce a better effect using the acrylics than I can with using enamels as well because I can progress the effect on quicker because the, the acrylics dry a lot quicker. But if I'm doing it from home like we are now, then I'll be using st stuff like enamels, acrylics, pigments, powders, mixing them all together to get the, the effect, the desired effect. So what we're going to do first is we're just going to put a, a light dust in the, the panel. Do a panel at a time. That way uh, you don't get carried away too much. It's all about you know, the attention to detail but doing it in a sort of controlled manner. That makes any sense. Okay. What do you use the two airbrushes? You use two different colours. Two different colours? That's simple enough. I usually use four but uh, the other two aren't, uh, aren't playing ball today. And you see a lot of, a lot of people posting about airbrushes and uh, obviously there's different qualities on the market so you've got the quite expensive sort of uh, models like Iwata, uh, Harder and Steamback, and then you get a lot of the cheaper Chinese uh, models available. Uh, what would you recommend for someone starting out? I have this question a lot when I'm at shows, and I always say, buy something at a reasonable price, not the bottom end of the market or the high end of the market. Always buy something sort of middle market, because if you've never used one before, and you start using it and you, you can't get on with it then it's just going to be boxed up put in the cupboard and you've wasted a lot of money there's a lot of startup kits out there as there has been for a number of years now where <clears throat> you can buy a pretty reasonable airbrush and a canister of air the problem with the canister of air is, is because of the the condensation it can cause uh, water droplets to come through the pipe 
so you can pick up a reasonable compressor and a reasonable um, airbrush I used to use Iowatters the one I used for quite a number of years was uh, an Iowato Neo which is a reasonable priced airbrush and it does exactly what you need it to do uh, but because I've got all kinds of different ones for all different types of techniques or effects then I've got stuff from Iowata uh, these are the harder and stain back but it's down to personal preference at the end of the day some people don't like the gravity fed some people like the jars to put underneath but for what I do mixing my own paints for doing the different types of tones then I can literally mix within the pot instead of having to take the pot off and then mix it there and then put the pot on uh, so for for me having a gravity fed airbrush is ideal for me but as I say it's all down to personal preference what people like to use um, but yeah it, it, it's best to shop around uh, there are some companies out there on the market that will you know do like special deals if you if you're looking at getting into it but if you're going to get into it and you want to pursue it keep practicing but just practice on an old scrap model or if you go to an exhibition where there's second hand stuff and you can pick a wagon up for 50 p or, or a pound just practice on that but don't go above the price range that is going to make you think oh no i don't want to do this and just put it in a cupboard and that's it you never see it again so all i'm doing now is with a fiber pen just lightly taking most of it off it's a process that not everybody does but i find it especially when it comes to a ready to run wagon it works pretty well um, because before me such as that i started bringing wagons like this out we used to have to build and you did part of the weathering before you actually painted it because it is already pre-painted you've got to find an alternative way of doing things so what we're going to do now is we're just going to go in with some clean thinner just to sort of take out the harshness of those marks always just go down never across because it sort of represents rain streaks as well but this is just one process of the actual effect that we're trying to achieve so <coughs> With a piece of old scrap plastic card, card, you can use a cereal box, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, you're only going to get paint on it, so you don't need to, anything too expensive. Cover up certain areas, so you're mas basically masking off what you don't want to spray. You just want to go back over what you've done, but in different areas not going back over the same panel all together so it really is a case of building the layers up very slowly and uh, adding small amounts of paint rather than trying to do it all in one hit yeah um it's what you got to remember is, is that when in real life with the real thing say it came out of the works painted really nicely and then it'd be doing the job that it's entailed to do be the actual weather that would actually weather the, the wagon or loco or coach whatever so what you're trying to do is you're trying to replicate years and years and years of wear and tear on a model two effects now we've got the one where we've just painted the panel used a fiber pen to remove the majority of the paint that i originally put on then we use the thinner over the area where I've just put the fiber pen to sort of blend in a few of the, the streaks which you can see just roughly around there that isn't finished yet but then what you do then is you go back over it <coughs> with a different color into certain areas such as where the frame is and at the top what you do then is because that paint is still going to be a little bit tacky you get some weathering powder now you don't have to mix the two together you can just do it individual just use the one and then what you're doing is you're stippling it you're literally stippling it into that corner where the paint has just been applied so is this a chalk based weathering powder yeah they're um these ones are woodland scenics but what you can also use is you can use um, a chalk 
pastel um, you can buy from any art shop they come in a pack and what you can do is you can literally use a scalpel blade uh, put it over the area that you want to put it over or put them in these little containers like I've got there which is what I've done with mine with that it saves on mess and it also means you're not you're not wasting too much but it goes to show you can do the weathering on, on a budget really because you don't need to use the expensive branded paints you know the Tamiya paints aren't the most expensive paints on the market are they? you don't need to spend hundreds of pounds doing this um, you know I use maybe four or five colours on this basic colours that have come from the shop and I can then mix probably about another 15 or 16 different colours by just using the ones that I've brought uh, so if you learn how to mix paint it does help because then you're not just using standard weathering paints just to blend it all in now when I do shows a lot of people say you use a clear coat on it when you put the weathering powder on I say no well you're mixing the clear to a colour why don't you mix a colour with a colour so because the one I've just sprayed on is a lot more translucent than the one I used previously what it does is it helps seal the, the weathering powder in but it doesn't take the tone away whereas if you use a lacquer it kind of enhances the colours because with weathering powders it's not just one colour there's loads of little pigments in there so you put a clear on there and it sometimes enhances certain colours that may be there and you're not getting that right tone that you want right so we've done that bit now now we go on to a pigment now these are life colour pigments ready available on the uh, internet uh, these were from uh, what used to be just like the real thing but now uh, MM1 so managed to get a full set of these these are rust pigments and you get about I think there's about six in a in a pack they're uh, they're pretty damn good on them so we've got three different colours here don't ask me which they are because I haven't got a clue right then we use a bit of sponge these are makeup sponges you can pick these up from any chemist supermarket um, buy a pack of I think there's about 30 or 40 in a pack I think they're only a couple of quid if that so what you do is you tear a bit off so you've got a different type of texture all the way around you can either use a crocodile clip on the end of a paintbrush or like I'm doing here a pair of tweezers and what you do is you pinch it so you've got the roughness of the sponge there you put it dip it into whatever colour you're trying to get but what you're going to do then is you're going to dab it onto the kitchen roll to get rid of the excess and then what you're going to do is lightly because you don't want to get the effect out you're going to just stipple it into certain corners and this is the bit that takes the time so you don't have to keep mixing the same colours you can just change it because rust is not all the same colour I'm guessing you're looking for the more is less effect with this because it's not something that's going to be going to the scrapyard it's something that's in use and service um, it all depends um, it all depends on what which wagon you're doing so like for this I'm just trying to give the effect of that it's been in service for a few years it's showing its age but it's not going to be sitting in the scrapyard for the next few years whereas later on when they started using these a lot of them were really rusty I've done a couple for myself you know both sides took 
three or four three or four days to do using just this one technique but it's just gradually building up I managed to get certain techniques done in a way which makes things look more I hope to other people as well makes it look more realistic Just trying to achieve a representation of what's out there in the real world. So while you're working away, can we have a chat about the Dapol wagons? Yeah, of course we can. What, what do you think of them? For what they are and for the price, you know, you can't you can't fault it to be fair. Um, you know, as we were saying earlier, when I first started in our gauge, you didn't have wagons such as this in such detail ready to run. So what we did was we had the, the, the Parkside Dundas kits, which are absolutely you know, brilliant. But then along come Dapol with their uh, mineral wagon. Then yeah, yeah. For, as I said, for the for the price and the detail and the quality, uh, you can't go wrong. Um, for those modellers out there, advanced modellers that have built kits in the past, then you can enhance on these. Um, you know, change numbers or do certain things to them that you want to do to them. For those that are coming into the hobby or coming into 7mm, then yeah, it's a great starting point for them. Because then if they then buy something such as this, and then think oh yeah well i've seen something either on the internet or in a magazine where i want to super detail something then for something like 40 quid or something that they just want to do i'm doing weathering yeah 40 quid's you know a lot of money in in a lot of, a lot of terms but it's not as much as going and buying a an o gauge loco and then weathering that so yeah it's a good way to cut your teeth really isn't it yeah. just to uh, yeah. get you started and yeah it is they, they, they... you know i started i've been modeling since day one you know i i was born into it so i don't know any different so i grew up with my dad t teaching me stuff how to build kits but that was the informal um how to paint how to do weathering you know back in that day we didn't have we didn't use airbrushes we used a technique called dry brushing um so he taught me stuff <coughs> back then uh but then when i went into o gauge as i said there was nothing like this about on the market so to get your teeth into it to get to get into the scale more so was to buy a kit around about 30 40 quid have a go at that if you didn't feel you were doing that well or you lost interest then 30 40 quid but if you enjoyed doing it then you progressed on to bigger things like a bigger wagon or a coach or a locomotive or and that's how it is it's just pro progression and the same as what i'm doing now start off with reasonable st priced equipment if you get into it and you want to achieve better and you think that it's going to become of an interest to you then you can progress but it takes time so going back over now with a, a lighter color and this colour I've only used three colours mixed with the original colour that I already did and then going back with the powders stippling it in mainly into the corners it's 
wind died around here as well, so apologies for that. Um, so, stipple that into the corners, get rid of the excess. If the excess particles of the powder do a streak or something, don't worry about it because it will just add to the, add to the effect. And then what we do with the other airbrush, with another colour which is diluted a bit, you go back over. Just slightly because you don't want to get you don't want to get rid of the effect that you've already done. Go back with the foam. Strip it, just get rid of the excess. And then just gently it's mainly paint chips, what that's what you're trying to achieve is just paint chips. And it just slightly shows the rust coming through. These pigments, once they're out of the jar, they do look a bit. What's the word I'm looking for? A bit bright. A bit bright, yeah. But they actually sort of, as they're drying, they lose that harshness. When I first used them, I, I, I used them on a funny enough I actually used them on a mineral wagon or a coal wagon and I looked and I thought nah that's too harsh that is but then like, I walked walk away come back and it had actually sort of settled down and it's just that sort of differences to achieve <coughs> the end result but it's all down to patience it's not it's not just about not just about putting the, uh, the paint on and then spraying a coat of track dirt or ballast or whatever you want to call it over it and just go along the body and do the chassis arm here as well Right here. I'm going to do a bit more on the door section. So obviously that would be used more. So let that dry for a few minutes. So coming back to uh, what we did previously on this section, we're now concentrating on the center section. Now you've probably realised that a lot more has been done to that section from the previous view. To achieve this little bit where you're getting paint chipping, the rust showing through, we're going to use a bigger portion of the sponge, put it into the lid. It's always best to use the lid because that way that if you don't use the pot you won't get too much. It's all about little is more. So you're dabbing it all off, hardly anything can. Now I'm going to pick it up. What we're going to do is we're just going to go in over that portion randomly and around there if you make a mistake it can be easily rectified but you're just trying to achieve the effect of the rust showing through a very worn wagon so you need to draw that pigment off okay. So you're just blowing air through the airbrush? Yeah, just blowing air through the airbrush just to get <coughs> dried quicker. So we're going to add another pigment. Mm. This one is burnt umber. Use I suppose you can give Laurie a plug while you're working as well now. So Laurie has got MMM models. Yeah, Laurie MM1 uh, supplies all Tamiya products. Also most of the range of life colour products. So if you're listening Laurie, 25% discount please kid. Um, he also supplied me with these little beauties. Just <coughs> pieces of card with laser cut different patterns on them. They're usually they're used not just for modelling but for custom airbrushing. But I find them pretty, pretty decent. So like if I want to put like a just a, just another just another layer of texture to put on, you're gonna be a bit ambidextrous here. But you can literally put the put the template where exactly where you want it or roughly where you want it 
don't spray it too too hard because you don't want, you don't want too much on so if you look closely you can just see where the textures just come up there now just that's adding not... another string to the bow sort of thing so you can just take time to sort of learn how to use them because there's a lot of different shapes and but I find them quite useful just for doing stuff like this um, as I say these are from a company called FX Texture I think as I say Laurie sent them for me they've helped me out a few times can you bit. just lift the wagon up to the camera so we can have a better look yeah. so we can see what we've done thank you yeah. So we're just going to go back over that bit. It's a process of you put it on. If you're not, not too happy with it, or well, I wasn't there. And it's just a process of taking bits off. Again, you don't have to use a clean thinner. If you use a an old jar, put a bit of thinner in there, and then when you wash your brushes out, you can also use your wash from there to do to do this as well adds a bit more texture to it i think the key thing we need to point out is using the correct thinners for the correct type of paint so because we're using a tammy acrylic paint we're using acrylic thinner yeah. tammy is isn't water based you know there are chemicals in there to dry it off <coughs> it's basically the stuff that goes in your screen wash so uh, use the manufacturer's thinners or the manufacturer's paint Okay, so I'm just going back over the areas that I weren't too happy with. And we're just going to enhance certain areas again. What I'm, doing is I'm trying to not get too much on this side of the body. So if I start with the card first, I can use that as a guide to bring it down. So what I'm doing is I'm using the overspray more from the card onto the model. To give you a more subtle effect and it's not about just getting the airbrush and doing this or doing this you've got to work within the pattern that you're trying to achieve as well relax and as close as you feel comfortable doing it and that only comes with practice so it, it takes a lot, lot of time to come to grips with knowing how to use an airbrush some people pick it up quite quickly others it takes the time but as i said it's perseverance all the time uh, and what we're going to do with a small bit of foam and so this process can take quite a few hours but we're just doing the basics got any comments you need any advice I mean, I've got a Facebook page called Dodges Weathering if you go on there and just send me a message I'll be more than happy to uh, help in any questions you've got answering anything that uh, you might want to know doesn't matter how silly the question may be if you need any advice that's what we're here for that's why when we're doing it shows people come to you and say oh, how'd you do this and how'd you do that that's why we do demos pass on the knowledge we've gained over the years with others. so hopefully in the future the hobby will last to uh, the next generation so talking about the show uh you've been a part of the Wally show for Ooh. how many years uh since 2008 and i got asked to build a couple of locos for pete in 2007 i built those locos for him and then uh, one day he said do you fancy doing shows I said yes. Uh, we got the wife on board actually because uh, she was better organising us than we were ourselves. So the first show we actually did together was Swindon, and then basically from there it just grew. So since about 2008, uh, we've been doing the shows. Um, you know, I've been either doing a building demonstration first and then a weathering demo and this is where the weathering demo has sort of grown on because probably over the last I don't know six or 
six, seven years, it's been more of a weathering demo than anything else, which I totally enjoy. That's my introduction to Wally 2008. Uh, being on the uh, the Waterman stand, made a, uh, quite a few friends on the way as well. So yeah, it's been uh, it's been enjoyable. Unfortunately, uh, with the current climate and everything going on, it's a shame that it's not on this year. But yes, yeah, the 2021. Absolutely. And before 2008, did you used to visit the show as a as a member of the public? <coughs> yeah. Um, just well, as a little backstory. Yeah, uh, my dad was an exhibitor and modeler. He did the old Wally show, the old Harry Mitchell Centre, many, many years ago. I remember going there as a kid with him, and then after he passed away, me and my mate used to go up there. So, yeah, it was uh, one of the highlights of the, the year for the, the model railway, even back then. The other shows, local shows, and swap meets that we used to go to, but you know, the Harry Mitchell, and then when he turned into the NEC. Well, when it went to the NEC, sorry, it was a uh, another must must go to uh, show. So yeah, it's, um, got happy memories of uh, Wally all through the years. So you've really come full circle now. You've sort of uh, been part of the well, part of the exhibit team, and with Pete Waterman actually being a, a member of the show, really. Yeah, sort of come full circle because we we started off as a small group. Well, my dad started off as a small group called the Highfield Modellers Group, and their club was at Torsley. And one of the locations that I actually were now is Torsley, so I've come a sort of full circle with that, plus with the model as well. So yeah, attending attending the Wally show <coughs> as a, a demonstrator or exhibitor. It's because obviously it brings back memories of when I worked with your dad. He was an absolutely fantastic modeler for the, for the yeah. time. And things that he taught me. Yeah, he taught me the basics, but from there I've, I've learned more. But to be fair, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you now. So, you know, it's it, it, full circle again. So, yeah, it's happy days bit more now I've done all three panels on the one side so I'm going to let them dry off same technique on all three just to uh, go back to the wheels put them in between your fingers make sure your air is not too aggressive and then just circular motion one side Either side. We let that dry for a bit, and while well, that one's drying, we do this one. Right, from there, <coughs> we change to a darker colour. And what I'm going to use is I'm going to use a matte black or as Tammy would call it, flat black. And this is just to highlight certain areas, areas that you probably won't see, yeah. it's running around. So added, add effect. Hold that. So it's just a subtle, subtle effect. Leave those to dry for a bit. Right, while we're waiting for those to dry, I just want to clean up a few areas <coughs> on the uh, on the frame. So, an easy way of just cleaning some of the weathering that I've done on the brake handle. If you get yourself a cotton bud, just wipe the excess thinners off you don't want it too wet and literally just stroke over it the area where the shunter's hand would have been so basically you're trying to get rid of that but leave a certain amount you can use a fibre pen for this or you can just use a brush with thins but i find it much easier to use a cotton bud it's a bit more delicate isn't it so you're not risking damaging or breaking parts i suppose yeah 
I used I use these sort of things on axle boxes as well. So if I'm doing a low coat, it's got painted axle boxes, especially on four mil low coat, dip it in a little bit, take it off. Right, so those are dry now. So what we're gonna do get our trusty brush for the weathering powder, just mix it a little bit in. You're gonna be too precise. Mix that again in there. Off me blow it off. Go back to the original colour, and all I'm going to do is from a distance seal that weathering powder in. <coughs> and then, if you want to go a bit further. the inside and the axle. And then put solid to one to dry. Uh, thanks for sharing uh, that demonstration with us. So we've got three wagons and they're all very different. Yeah, the uh, two to the left are uh, in different stages of part of their lives. The one on the right, not as heavily weathered as the two, because that would have probably been a sort of 60s period. But it just shows you that it's it's a bit more work worn than it would have been. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it just goes to show that using the same techniques on the one that we've just done, uh, you can achieve uh, anything from light, medium, or really heavy, or even if you want one that's virtually going into the scrap line. Okay, that's great. We've obviously, we normally see you at the show and you've got some loco, so a lovely class 37 there in Dutch livery. How does the techniques change when you do a loco? It changes from doing anything from a wagon, loco or coat. This is where the reference comes in. Uh, plenty of photographs and knowing where the dirt, dirt deposits would be. Um, obviously with locos, steam are completely different to diesel but you've still got the steam engines, you've got oil, water marks, coal, dust etc. Uh, with the diesels you've got the oil again. The thing is with, with it as well is it all depends on where you're actually or what you, what area you mod because certain locations had a different effect. Say for argu arguments say the west in the latter part of their days because they spent a lot of time down on the south west around Dawlish and that I think it was at Lera they used a, an acid wash and they were heavily bleached but it wasn't just that it could have been the sea air as well that did it it all depends this is where your reference comes in it's all to do with reference looking at plenty of photographs and knowing your colours as well you know some people see a, a colour differently to what I do or you you know it's just trial and error you know and after 30 odd years of doing this I'm still learning you know I'll never stop learning because I still want to achieve better than I did before you know it's all about learning reference practice to achieve a result that you see before you that's brilliant and um, we can come and find you hopefully at the 2021 show on the Pete Waterman stand fingers Fing crossed fingers crossed and anyone that's got any questions come and see you yeah uh, for questions that you ask you know come and watch your work yeah either come and see me or if you want to get in touch with me before and uh, I've got a Facebook page called Dodgy's Weathering um, you can message me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can with my real job I work shift so now I have to apologise in advance if you do message me and I miss it and I don't reply as soon as possible it's probably because I'm fast asleep in bed because I've been on a week of nights but if anybody's got any questions doesn't matter how trivial send me a message and I'll be more than willing to help if I can that's been brilliant thank you so much for your uh, time today it's a uh, pleasure i've learned quite a lot and i'm sure the viewers will as well so thank you that's a pleasure and, and uh, everybody stay safe and we'll see you next year at the show yeah. happy modeling thank you for watching this Wally virtual event presentation please remember to like comment and subscribe. We hope to see you when we are back at the NEC on the 27th and 28th of November 2021.